The prisoner's dilemma is an incredibly important concept. When economist John Nash put the idea into words, it really changed the world. It ended up affecting not just economics, but world politics too. The government even hired game theorists to think about nuclear warfare. After all, there's no more important time to figure out an opponent's strategy than during war. So to put it mildly, this is an important idea. But you might notice that the prisoner's dilemma is missing something important. What if you play the game more than once? Coke and Pepsi may act like two prisoners in the dilemma when setting advertising in one year. But in reality, they set advertising every year. So take the Coke and Pepsi example and imagine that they are making the advertising decision in every period, not just once. Now imagine that Coke says the following to Pepsi, I won't advertise as long as you don't, but if you ever break your promise, then I'll advertise forever. Now think about Pepsi's choice in period one. If they advertise in period one, they'll take over the market. They get 11 day and Coke will get zero. But Coke has told them that Coke will retaliate in that case. As a result, in every period for the rest of time, both Coke and Pepsi only get three. Now what if Pepsi chooses not to advertise in period one? Then Pepsi will only get eight, not 11. But they can get eight in the next period and the period after that and so on, as long as they don't advertise. Getting eight every period forever is a much better deal than getting 11 today and three every period after that. So Pepsi is better off cooperating than not cooperating. In other words, the repeated game, combined with Coke's threat, has caused the market to move towards a cooperative equilibrium, which is better for both firms. Happy end of the story? Sadly not. This solution only works if the game goes on forever. For example, imagine the government announces that it's going to ban sugary sodas in 10 years. Now think about year 10. Pepsi may as well advertise and get 11 in year 10 because Coke can't do anything about it in the future. After all, there's no sugary sodas in the future, so Coke can't retaliate. But Coke isn't stupid. They know this too. So Coke will break its promise in the 10th year as well. Why? Because it knows Pepsi will advertise. Coke will get three if it breaks its promise and zero if it doesn't. So Coke will break the promise in year 10. So the dominant strategy in year 10 for both firms is to advertise. But now think about year nine. Pepsi knows that next year Coke will break its promise. So why would it cooperate in year nine if it knows that Coke is gonna break its promise next year? That means in year nine, Pepsi will once again advertise. It can get 11 from advertising instead of eight from not advertising. And there's no future benefit from keeping up the agreement since Pepsi knows Coke will abandon its promise in year 10. This vicious cycle keeps going. Pepsi will advertise in year nine and Coke knows this, so they'll break the promise in year nine. And that means that Pepsi will do the same thing in year eight and Coke will too. This keeps going back in time, and you can see that this ends up with both firms advertising right away in year one. So we're back exactly where we started. This complicated example illustrates the richness of game theory, an exciting field worth studying in its own right. In college, you may be able to take an entire course in game theory. But the bottom line is that it's hard to escape the prisoner's dilemma.